G'day everyone and welcome to St. Paul's Online. It is great to have you with us. My name is Jack Day. I'm one of the pastors here at St. Paul's. And whether you are one of our regulars, you've been at church with us for years, or whether this is your very first time tuning in, or anywhere in between, it's wonderful to have you here today. We're here to lift our eyes from the everyday and to fix our hearts and our minds on the things above, the things of God, the things that God has done for us in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll be doing that as we open the Bible and hear from God's Word. We'll be doing it as we sing God's truth, perhaps in your heart uh, with thanksgiving to God, perhaps out loud to those people who are with you in the room at a watch party. It's worth noting that we are doing things a little bit differently today. As we continue our journey through the Bible in the book of Romans, today we come to Romans chapter 7, which is a wonderful and important part of God's Word, but it is a part that is challenging and complex. It's a part of the scriptures that has raised issues and questions for the Christians who've wrestled with it for hundreds and hundreds of years. Perhaps you've been wrestling with Romans 7 already this week with your growth group, and you've come full of those questions today. We think it's worth taking a little bit of extra time to grapple with this part of the Bible. So today, Sam Russell will be bringing us our Bible talk in two parts. In the first part, we will be thinking through the passage from a high level, thinking about the kind of framework, the kind of angle that God wants us to see this text from. And then in the second part of the talk, we'll be getting into the details, working through the passage, and thinking about how God wants us to live in light of it. We think it's worth taking a bit of extra time to work through this passage, not just because of Romans 7 in its own right, but also because the better we understand this passage today, the better we'll be equipped for next week as we come to Romans chapter 8 and think about God's no condemnation, freedom bringing love for us in Christ Jesus. So before Morgan reads the passage to us in a moment, we're going to pray. We always need to pray as we come to the scriptures, and that is certainly true today. So would you please pray with me? Thank you, Father, that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Open our hearts to receive your word, that we may know you better and be thoroughly equipped for every good work through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hi, I'm Morgan. I'm one of the ministry apprentices here, and today we're reading Romans 7, verses 7 to 25. So open your Bible to chapter 7 or click the link in the description below and we'll start from verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. 
But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. I remember as a teenager going on a uh, trip to New Zealand. It was a school tour. And as part of the tour, uh, we walked along Milford Sound. Uh, great walking track, beautiful countryside. And part of the tour involved a, a hike up what is known as the McKinnon Pass. And uh, it's this huge trek, kind of up a quite steep mountainous terrain. And uh, it's worth the climb because when, when you get to the top, it's just got this incredible view out over Milford Sound. Problem is you have to climb it. And uh, that day was a long, it was a gruelling walk up a mountain. I remember it was tough. I, I remember getting tired, getting frustrated because you just couldn't see uh, the destination. There was quite some mist at times and plus all these rocks that you had to kind of clamber over. But if you're stuck at it and you kind of follow the map and you make it to the summit and the view from up there, the, the reward is, is breathtaking. And over the last few weeks, we have been climbing up towards the summit of Romans chapter 8, and we're almost there. But today, there's some challenging and, and, and misty and even rocky terrain uh, kind of on the climb upwards. You see, our passage today, Romans chapter 7, uh, it's a wonderful but tricky passage. I, I don't know if you found that in your growth group this week. We did. Uh, it's tough. It's, it's not completely straightforward what Paul is saying in this chapter. And what makes it even more difficult is that when you read many of the commentators on this passage, you'll find that they also find it hard. And in fact, many of them come to quite different conclusions about what the chapter is all about. In fact, within the evangelical scholarly world, uh, there are quite different views about this chapter and wise people, people we would call brothers and sisters, come to different conclusions from each other when it comes to Romans chapter 7. Uh, good people disagree about this passage, which, means teach, which makes teaching it uh, quite tricky uh, because no matter which way I go, which way I land today, uh, I'm going to find myself on the opposite side to people that I call brothers and sisters and uh, wise and godly people will disagree about this passage. Now, some of you be thinking, well, hang on, what, what's the issue here? Uh, there's a debate about Romans chapter 7? I, I had no idea. And the answer is yes, th there is a debate about Romans 7. In fact, there are two main issues that are contested when it comes to this passage. Uh, firstly, it's a question about who the I is in this passage. Did you notice that as, as we read it today? Uh, there's, Paul uses the first person, I, and, and there are some views. Some say, well, of course, it's Paul, while others say, no, perhaps it's a, a literary device employed by Paul to speak on behalf of another group. That, that's the first issue, who is the I? The second issue is once you've worked out who the I is, is the I Christian or not Christian? Now, some of you are thinking, look, I'm not sure I care, Sam. That sounds like the kind of thing that the kind of Bible nerds geek out on, but I, I'm not too fussed. Somebody else can have those discussions. Does it really make a big difference? And I want to gently suggest today that, well, actually, yes, it, it does matter for, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, what we're dealing with here is the Word of God. In fact, that's true every week, isn't it? We always need to take the time with God's word to make sure that we really are uh, listening to what it says rather than just glancing over it at surface level because God has important things for us in each passage that he wants us to hear. That, that's why he gave it to us. Uh, and so it's important for us to slow down and think, even if that's hard, and, and not just to take a view because, well, I don't really want to think too deeply about it. Uh, but secondly, it's important to do the work on this passage uh, because the way you read this passage impacts the way you think about your life as a Christian. You see, if this is Paul speaking about his Christian life, then his conclusions about the struggle with sin that he talks about, well, that needs to shape your expectations when it comes to your life as a Christian. But if this is Paul describing his pre-Christian life, then what he's describing here is not your daily struggle against sin, but rather the struggle of an unbeliever or perhaps a Jew without the gospel, someone who needs salvation and needs the Holy Spirit to start putting sin to death. Do, do you see the difference? How you read this passage will, will shape what you think about your own daily wrestle with sin. And so for those among us who think, well, I don't really enjoy thinking theologically, that's just not for me. This is actually important stuff. 
And I hope that at the end of it, you're feeling well equipped to make up your mind about what this passage means. And so what I want to do is first, I want to step you through some of the different views around Romans 7 to help you navigate some of the discussion before preaching to you my actual sermon later in the service. So you ready to go? Uh, at the heart of the debate about, around Romans chapter 7 is these two puzzles uh, that we need to tease out. And the first centers around the identity of the I in Romans chapter 7. Did, did you notice that Paul, he seems to change voice as a writer in, in verse 7. And he seems to adopt an autobiographical voice. And it's quite obvious. Now, all of a sudden, there are all these eyes everywhere. I mean, have a look. Verse 5, got up here on the screen for you. Uh, he, he's speaking in the we. He says, For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But then you flick over just two verses, and all of a sudden, the eyes are everywhere. Romans chapter 7, verse 7, What shall we say then? Uh, is the law sin? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin is had it not been for the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Come down to verse 9 and Paul says, Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. And this I language carries on right throughout the chapter. And so we need to ask, well, who's the I? Now, at first glance, you might think, well, it's, it's obvious. It's, it's Paul. He ta Paul talking about his experience of life and what the law did to him. And, and we seem to resonate with it because it feels like it describes what the law does to us. And so we conclude that Paul just is writing personally here. However, that gets complicated as we start to try and hold that idea up with what we know about Paul's own story from other passages of the Bible. You see, here in Romans 7, he says he's so sinful and so deceived by sin that, that he breaks the law and he covets it. He's quite negative about his, his experience with the law. But then when you take a passage like Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, where, where Paul writes about his old life, he's actually very positive about his experience with the law. Have a look at this. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. Here it is, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. If Romans 7 is purely autobiographical, then how do we reconcile Paul in, in one passage saying that the law produced every kind of sinful desire in him and another saying that his righteousness based on the law was faultless? And you add to that, you come down to Romans chapter 7 and verse 9. Uh, Paul says, Once I was alive from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. In what sense was Paul, the devoted Jew, ever alive apart from the law? I mean, he was circumcised on the eighth day. He never knew a day without the law. How was he alive without the law? And so the more likely suggestion is that Paul in Romans 7 is probably using a rhetorical device. Uh, that is, that Paul shifts dramatically to the first person in order to speak rhetorically on behalf of a group. Uh, and there are a few options that the commentators put forward about who that group might be. The first one is, is that Paul is actually here speaking as Adam. That is, if you read the I as Adam, well, then it kind of works nicely. Uh, Adam, alive, apart from the law. But when the commandment came, uh, uh, sin sprang to life for Adam and Adam died. Uh, Adam deceived by sin. Adam got the consequence of death. Paul could be speaking as Adam. Now, there's, there's definitely parallels there, aren't there? But the problem is that Paul doesn't actually mention Adam here. And actually, he was quite happy to do that back in Romans chapter 5. And so if he did it back there, why not mention him here? Why be so cryptic? Uh, secondly, if you're going to talk about the law, which is what Paul talks about here, Adam never got the law. Adam got a command, but we're talking the Mosaic law here in Romans 7. Why would Paul say that the law put Adam to death? That seems odd. So uh, th that leads to the next possibility that the I might be Israel. Now, now this is the view that I got taught at Moore College, and uh, there's a strong case here. Uh, the argument is that the law here in Romans 7 is the Mosaic law, and so therefore the I here is actually Israel receiving the law at Sinai. Uh, and, and you know what happened? They received the law at Sinai, and what happened straight away? They broke it. Israel, alive, apart from the law, saved out of Egypt, but then the law came and, well, they died. 
Uh, and so the argument goes that the giving of God's law at Sinai actually provoked disobedience within Israel. And that's what Paul is speaking of here. Add to this fact that Jews had this strong sense of personal identity with their national story. And so you could certainly see it as Paul speaking on behalf of Israel, including himself. Now, how are you going at this point? We're climbing up through the mist, aren't we? Over some rocks. Now, why does all this matter? Well, if it's true that Romans 7 is actually about Israel's struggle because of the law, then what Romans 7 is actually describing is not my struggle, but the struggle of someone who doesn't yet have the gospel. That, that is, Israel's struggle would be under the law. This is not my struggle as a Christian. Now, lots of wise people read it that way, but I take it that that still leaves you with some problems. For would Paul really describe Israel before they received the law as alive apart from the law? Uh, that the description, if you go back to Exodus, is that Israel are slaves. And then actually they whinge and grumble and complain to God, wanting to go back stubbornly to slavery. And alive without the law is just not the most obvious description if you're going to describe Israel. And secondly, again, I, I think it's just a bit cryptic. Paul happily speaks about Israel in Romans chapter 9, 10 and 11. Uh, why doesn't he speak directly about them here if that's who he really means? Which brings us back to Paul. You see, having surveyed all of this, I think that the simplest way to, to read the chapter is that this is Paul using a rhetorical device that does describe him, but in fact describes everyone. It's him speaking on behalf of all of us. That's why we can see the parallels with Adam and with Israel and, and in fact, with us. Uh, Paul is explaining something that is really true of, of all humanity as they come into contact with God's law. And we feel this, don't we? You read this and it feels like it just rings true of your experience of life. And so I take it that Paul is, is speaking on behalf of us all, uh, him as all of us, universalizing for humanity, so that when you read it, whether as a Jew or a Gentile or a Christian, you understand what happens when God's law is brought to bear upon sinful people. This is Paul speaking on behalf of everyone. Now, how are you going at this point? We are climbing the mountain, aren't we? Uh, hang in there. We're, we're halfway through this first part. Now, that's puzzle number one. But remember, I said there were two puzzles. The second puzzle is, if it is Paul speaking on behalf of all humanity, is this Paul speaking as a Christian or Paul before his conversion? And the difficulty with Romans chapter 7 is that Paul seems to say some things that you could read either way. You see, on, on the one hand, he says some pretty negative things about himself that could lead you to think that Paul is talking about his non-Christian, unregenerate life. So, for example, in verse 14, he says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Now, that doesn't sound like the words of a regenerate Christian, unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin, especially when you think back to, to Romans chapter 6, where, where Paul used that very language of, of slavery to sin to describe our pre-Christian lives. And so on first glance, you think, well, Paul must be describing his pre-Christian life. Uh, similarly, down in Romans chapter 7, verse 23, uh, Paul says that, uh, that he is a prisoner of the law of sin at work within him. Again, Romans chapter 6 would suggest that this is not a Christian. But that's only half the story. Because on, on the other hand, Paul says some things about himself that make you think that he is describing his Christian life. Firstly, he says six times through Romans chapter 7 that he really does desire to do what God wants. That is, he seems to have these new desires that line up with the desires of a Christian. He wants to do God's law. And secondly, he says down in verse 22, he says, For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. Now, that sounds very much like a regenerate person, because the unregenerate do not love God's law. In fact, as we're going to see when we come to Romans 8 in a couple of weeks, I've got it here on the screen for you. Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Paul says, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So when Paul says that he loves God's law, 
then he must be Christian because the unregenerate, they they can't do that. They're, They're hostile to God's law. And so here's the difficulty. If you read chapter 7 as Paul the Christian, you're in conflict with chapter 6 where Paul says that slaves to sin aren't Christian. But if you read it as Paul the non-Christian, then you're in conflict with chapter 8 which says that non-Christians don't love God's law. Do you see the problem? So how do we resolve the tension? Well, you need to make your own mind up. But for me, I've changed my view in the last two years as as I've studied Romans in preparation for these series over the last couple of years uh, coming through college I took the view that this was Paul the non-Christian describing his pre-Christian life as a slave to sin but in reading Romans over the last couple of years as we've studied together I've changed my view now I think that Paul is here actually describing one aspect of the Christian life here in Romans 7. Let me tell you why. I've got four reasons why I think Paul is speaking of his Christian regenerate life. The first is the tenses of the chapter. You see, in verses 7 through 13, Paul speaks in the past tense about his conversion and what happened when the law comes to bear upon a sinner. The law made him realize that he was spiritually dead. But then Paul changes tense into the present tense in verse 14 to to describe his, and I take it, all Christians' experience of struggling against sin. And part of the reason that I'm drawn to that view is it just seems to me the most natural movement from past tense to present tense. But secondly, and perhaps more weighty for me, is Paul's claim down in verse 22 that in his inner being, He delights in God's law. Now, if you chase down that phrase, inner being, as Paul uses it in the New Testament, you'll see that Paul uses it to describe the new heart of the converted believer. Uh, Let me share just one of them with you where I think it's really, really clear. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, he says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self, same phrase, literally our inner being is being renewed day by day. You see here in in, in the passage, Paul is talking about these two realities that the Christian experiences. Uh, There's our outer self, uh, our body. In Romans chapter 7, he calls this the flesh or the sinful nature, which Paul says is wasting away. It's it's experiencing the brokenness of sin and and, and it's passing away. But then he also speaks about this new inner self or, or inner being, which is being renewed day by day now that we're in Christ Uh, the inner self that's the the new part of us that's been freshly created now that we're in Christ it happened at our conversion but that new self is still clothed in, in a weak perishing body with a sinful nature And Paul speaks of the same dichotomy here in Romans chapter 7 when when he speaks of being a a slave to sin. He says that's the case in his sinful nature, in his body. Uh, Every time he speaks of the sinful nature, he points that it's connected to his flesh, while the references to loving God's law seem to be connected to his inner being which I think fits very naturally with what we should expect the Christian life to be like Uh, we have a newly created inner self uh, which loves God's law connected to a fleshly fallen body which is still waiting for redemption now thirdly and kind of building on this Paul then seems to put some distance between himself and his flesh notice he says down in verse 17 when he's talking about his sin he says as it is as it is it is no longer I myself who do it but it is sin living in me he recognizes that the sin and the flesh remain but for Paul that's not the totality of who he is who he really is is the new person the the inner being the inner self and finally and this is the clincher for me if Paul was speaking of the non-Christian life uh, here in Romans chapter 7 then you would think that after he kind of calls out for deliverance in, in in chapter in verses 24 and 25 where he says what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death you'd expect him to kind of roll on to the solution in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 that there's now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus but he doesn't what he does is he cries out in the midst of this tension But then what you get is the second half of verse 25 where he he kind of brings it to a a summary statement where he says, So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. That second half of verse 25 functions as a summary of the whole chapter. Uh, 
And the summary reinforces the tension that Paul is explaining right throughout this passage, that in his mind, he's one thing, but in his flesh, he's another. And so I take it that this struggle is one of the aspects, perhaps not the whole picture, but one of the aspects of the normal Christian reality. That as Christians, we are living in a long, drawn out, internal battle against the sin in our flesh. It's a battle of the old self versus the new self. Now, you might have some questions and that's okay. We haven't finished yet. In fact, we haven't even begun the proper sermon. We're going to do that. But let's pause at this point. Let's sing together. We're going to rejoice in, in the holiness of God. He's the Holy One, not us. And then we'll come back and look together at this passage in a little bit more detail. Welcome to Church St. Paul's. We are from Afternoon Church. My name is Ivy. We have Lily, Mike, Ben and Kevin with us. We would love for you to sing along with us to praise our great God. Let's sing. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Well, a few years ago, Sophie and I watched that uh, fantastic TV show, Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. Did you watch that? I love that show. Uh, I never knew that I could be so excited about housework. 
And uh, Marie, she, she's just incredible. Uh, she, she's got this kind of great philosophy uh, that uh, ways to deal with clutter and mess in your life. And you do it simply by following these six rules and all of a sudden your house is kind of cleared out and everything that you look at just kind of sparks joy within. And uh, when we watched the show, oh man, we were inspired. Uh, we, we kind of piled up all our junk, big pile, went through it, sorted it out and asked ourselves the questions, all that kind of stuff. And it was great for about the first week. Uh, house was clean, cupboards organized, not overflowing, papers away, and uh, you have this sense, finally, I have this new life of tidiness that I've, that I've always wanted to live. But then uh, about a week later, reality kicks in and uh, you just don't have time to, f- to fold the shirt in the Marie method and you don't have time to ask whether or not the bank statement actually sparks joy. And so you just put it down on the bench with all the other ones. And uh, what you find is that after turning over a new leaf, you're old messy habits are still alive and well and you think maybe there's something wrong with me why can't i do this everyone else seems to be so organized and perhaps you know that feeling now whether it's with clutter or just with some other struggle that you have now today as we're working our way through romans chapter 7 paul is helping us to think through our struggle not against clutter but against sin and in particular Paul is thinking through the role of God's law when it comes to that struggle. And Paul is talking law because over the course of Romans 5, 6, 7, 8 so far, Paul's actually said a whole bunch of negative things about God's law that his readers might be asking whether or not he's rejecting the law altogether. Let me show you some of the negative things that Paul has been saying so far throughout the book of Romans. At Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in the sight of uh, in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Now, that's, that's a negative statement about the law. Uh, then uh, look at this next one. Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Paul says, The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. A- and then in last week's passage with Dave, he says, For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. Uh, Paul has been harping on about all these negative consequences that come from the law. And you can imagine Paul's readers asking, well, are you rejecting God's law completely? Are you saying that the law is actually a bad thing? And if that were true, then it would be a very serious charge indeed. For the Old Testament shows us that the law was given by God as a good gift to his people Israel. Uh, To call the law sin That'd be a very serious charge indeed. And so Paul is responding here to this objection that his gospel calls the law sin. And you see the the objection there in Romans chapter 7, uh, verse 7. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? And as has been his pattern over the last few chapters, Paul responds to this objection with a strong denial. Verse 7, he says, certainly not. It's the same as all the other ones, by no means. And then actually come down to verse 12 with me, where Paul shows us what he thinks about the law. The law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. The law, according to Paul, is not sinful. And what we get in the verses in between is an explanation of the relationship that law and sin find themselves in. And so verse 7, Paul says, Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. And Paul's point is that law reveals sin that is uh, paul wouldn't have known what sin was without the law paul's point is that law reveals sin paul wouldn't have known what sin was without the law and paul's point is that sin was there even before it was codified as sin by the law but when the law gets added it exposes sin as sin the law helps us to see that sin really is sin Uh, we, we can put it on a diagram like this you've got the good law and sin and what the law does is it exposes sin as sin. It, it's a little bit like when you turn a light on in a room. Now, all the things in the room are there before you put the light on, but now with the light shining on the once dark room, you can see what was always there. That's the law. It exposes sin as sin and it helps us to understand what God has always deemed as right and wrong. And that's what Paul is saying here. The law exposes sin. Now, 
A few years back, when our kids were, were young, uh, we had a problem with one of them drawing on the walls. And now, in our household, a rented house, uh, drawing on the walls was always wrong. You don't get your bond back when that happens. And so it was never the right thing to do. But when we as parents uh, articulated the rule, thou shalt not draw on the wall, then it became clear to our budding young artist who was drawing on the wall that that was wrong. It had always been wrong. But the law, the rule, made it clear that it was wrong. And so Paul uses this example for us here in verse 7, the example of coveting. He says, For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. Law exposes sin. But that's only half the story because what happens next is when law comes and shines its light upon sin, the sin within us takes the law and exploits that for sinful purposes. And that's what Paul is getting at here in verse 8. He says, verse 8, But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. That was Dave's point from last week. The the keep off the grass sign, it gets exploited by our sinful natures. And we just want to break the rule. Uh, The command to stay off the grass just gives me ideas about what I might do on the grass. And what Paul is saying is that the real problem here is not the law, but sin. Sin is there within us and and at the moment that the command comes, it's stirred up by the command and then verse 9, what happens is sin springs to life and we die. It's a little bit like with your grass in the middle of winter. You've got, unbeknownst to you, all these dormant weeds in, under the soil and you can't see them, but they're there. And then what happens? Uh, well, the, the weed was always there, but with the coming of the spring rains, well, well, now the weeds that were there spring to life and they ruin the yard. Uh, it's, not just, it's not that the water is bad. Uh, the weed is the problem. The we just uses the opportunity provided by the water. It's the same with sin and the law. The law is like water. It's good. But if you add it to a garden full of dormant weeds, well, the weeds spring up and the garden dies. And so Paul's conclusion is there for us in, in verse 10. And he says, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. The law was the good way that God laid out for his people to live. But because sin had been sown within us, when the law comes, we sprout death. So the problem's not with the law, it's with us. Sin is the problem. The the law's like the water, verse 12. It's good. It's holy. It's righteous. The problem is the sin within us. Sin takes advantage of the law and kills us. And so we we can finish off our diagram here on the screen. Uh, The good law exposes sin, but sin exploits God's good law. Uh, Sin takes God's law and uses it as a way to put us to death. The, The law is good. The problem is what sin does with it. Which then leads us to the second objection that that Paul answers in today's passage. And you see it down there in verse 13. He says, did that which is good then, the law, become death to me? And and again, Paul gives us his, his emphatic denial. He says, by no means. And again, Paul lays the blame, not with the law, but squarely at the feet of the sin within us. Have a look down in verse 14. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual. It's good, but I... Am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Now, the law is spiritual. It's a good thing. The problem is with us. uh, We are, well, the NIV says unspiritual, uh, which I think is a bit of a poor translation. It just kind of sounds like we're the type of people who just don't like yoga, you know, unspiritual. Uh, But that's that's not what the word means. The, The word literally there is the word fleshly, of the flesh. That is. We've got this body with a sinful nature. There is the problem, the sinful nature. Uh, 
We live in these fleshly bodies that are not yet finally redeemed because the law has only invaded part of us. Our flesh, our sinful nature still remains. And in fact, it's ruined so much so that even when God's law does come, you see it in verse 15, we become these bundle of of moral contradictions. Look at verse 15. He says, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do, but what I hate I do. You see, the problem here is not the law, but rather a sinful human. And I take it you, like me, you you resonate with this description. Uh, Have you ever had the experience of verse 18? You have the desire to do what is good, but you cannot carry it out. Uh, But instead, verse 19, you don't do the good you want to do, but the evil you do not want to do, that you keep on doing. And Paul makes two points for us here. Uh, Firstly, he shows that shows us that when this struggle is happening, the law is doing its job. The law is functioning just as it was designed. We're agreeing that it's good. Uh, it's, It's doing what it was designed to do, which is showing us our sin. But secondly, Paul is also pointing out that as a Christian, when the law comes to you, something has now changed from before you were a Christian. And what Paul is showing us here is that while it used to be that I as a whole always did evil that was Romans 6 I was totally a slave to sin now I have a new heart verse 22 he says in my inner being I delight in God's law that is as a saved person I love what God says and I want to do what is good but while I live in this fleshly body There's a war going on. There's a struggle, a fight. And the struggle goes like this in my inner being, in the new self that's been established at my conversion. I love God's law. And yet here in my flesh, in in my body, sin continues to dwell and to fight me. And here I think we have a picture of the struggle that characterizes what the Christian experiences. We are torn between the pull of two laws. We really do delight in God's law. God's word shows us the good life. And as we read the Bible and we hear God's word, we think, yes, that's what I want to do. I delight in that. And yet verse 23, Paul says, but I also see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin within me. In my fleshly body, my own self fights me when I want to do good. And Paul says, verse 24, that that, that fight, that war, it makes you feel wretched, doesn't it? Do you know that feeling? You, you, You knew the good that you wanted to do, but sure enough, your flesh wages its war and takes you prisoner and drags you back into your old sinful habits. And And Paul sums up our experience in verse 25, the second half. He says, So then I in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature I'm a slave to the law of sin. That's the experience of a Christian. When law comes and meets the sin within us. And as we move towards a close today, I want to draw three very important applications out of this chapter. Three things to keep in mind as you fight your fight against the flesh. The first one is, where is the solution to all of this? Well, Paul cries out, verse 24, he says, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And his answer is, verse 25, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul's point in in all of this is that Jesus is always the solution. What God's law does is to show us just how yawning and big the gap between the holy God and my sin really is. And and we can see this on on a diagram. Let let me see if I can show this to you. Uh, Here, God's law gives us an awareness of God's holiness. It shows me that there's a yawning gap between the holiness of God and my sinful soul and what's the solution well we know it's the cross this is what uh, romans has been teaching us so far that jesus rescues me he bridges the gap between the holiness of god and the sinfulness of my soul and what romans 7 is showing us is that this is not just a one-off transaction rather God's law, as I continue to read it and meditate on it and delight in it, I learn over the course of the Christian life that God is in fact even holier than I realized he was when I was first converted. And so we could say as time goes on, there's my conversion. What happens is I have a growing awareness of God's 
holiness. I thought God was holy when I first came to him as a sinner, but he's, I realize as I meditate on God's law, he's even more holy than I first realized. And tied with that is the fact that as I go on in the Christian life and I read God's law, I also come to appreciate a growing awareness of my own sinfulness. I thought I was a sinner when I was first converted. As time goes on and I listen to God's word, I see that sin is actually far deeper than I ever realized. And so what goes with this is a growing appreciation for the scale of the cross of Christ. That Christ died in my place, not just back when I was first converted, but actually he continues to bridge the gap between God's holiness and my sinfulness, which the law shows me is an ever-increasing and yawning gap. Christ paid for my sin and he paid for yours too. And he he gives you his righteousness as a gift. and, And we see that that is a gift that just keeps on giving. And we bow down in worship to him for the sheer scale of his grace that he's achieved in the cross of Christ for us. You see, friends, that's how the law functions for the believer. It magnifies the cross and it teaches you just how much Christ has done on your behalf. And yet, I think there is even more here than that. Because notice the scale of Paul's cry for deliverance. Paul is looking towards the future and he says, Who will rescue me? from this body that is subject to death. Uh, Paul is not just thinking about the past deliverance of Jesus on the cross. It's also about the future deliverance of Jesus on that great day of resurrection when the believer will actually put off their old fleshly body and be clothed with a new redeemed resurrection body. And you see, Paul, all the way through Romans 7, he, he understands where our problem lies. It lies in our sinful body. And that's why he says, who will rescue me from this body of death? Paul knows that up until the return of Jesus, our very bodies, our flesh will be fighting against us. That's why Paul says over in Romans chapter 8, 23, let me show it to you up here on the screen. He says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Until we have a new body, this is the fight that we're in. We know the law in our inner self, but the body just isn't fit for purpose. And so where does Paul turn? Well, he looks forward with yearning to the return of Jesus. He says, who will rescue me from this body of death? Verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, Jesus will bring deliverance on that great day of resurrection glory. It's only then, though, that this problem will be really fixed. And so as you feel the Romans 7 struggle, day in, day out, Paul is saying, set your hope upon the return of Jesus, knowing that that is the moment when you will be delivered. So I want to ask you, is that something that you do? Do you pray longingly for the return of Jesus, knowing that when he comes, you will change? Every time you pray for change, pray also for the return of Jesus. Pray for that day when he will deliver you from your body of death and look forward to your new, resurrected, redeemed body that no longer knows the ravages of sin and death. And finally, as I say that, I can hear the questions coming and we'd love to take your questions on the extras this week. Uh, The questions out there, which will be, so are you saying that there's no hope for change now? That sin is just inevitable until Jesus' return? Well, what we need to see is that Paul's point in Romans chapter 7 is not yet about how to fight sin, but rather about the role of the law. And his big point is law is good, but it's powerless. The law shows you the life that God desires, but it's powerless as a weapon in the fight against sin. That was Dave's point last week, Romans chapter 7 and verse 6, that that we have been released from the law and we can now serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. As we fight against sin, we need the Spirit of God. Uh, We need Him to take 
God's law and, and write it onto our hearts. We need the Spirit to change us from within so that we love the things that God's love and teach us to hate what God hates and so put sin to death. And that's what is coming in Romans chapter 8 when Paul's going to speak about putting to death the misdeeds of the body. And so I really want to invite you to be back here next week as we finally come to the peak of the mountain and look out at the view of Romans chapter 8. Uh, Paul is going to speak about the great power that we have in God's Holy Spirit. But what Romans 7 is showing us is that until the day of Christ, even as we learn to kill sin by the power of the Spirit, the war will rage on in our flesh. And the fact that you are battling is a sign that you are one of Christ's people. And I often talk with Christians who say, well, Sam, I just keep seem to fighting the same old sins over and over and I feel like I'm just struggling with the same stuff. Does that mean I'm not one of God's people? And I want to say Romans 7 says, welcome to the family. This is the nature, one aspect of our life in Christ. It is a struggle and it will remain so until the end. And so I want to ask, what are you struggling with at the moment? Uh, God wants you to know that the very presence of a struggle is evidence that the new inner self that delights in God's law is alive and well. And so let me encourage you to keep on fighting, keep on struggling. It's a long road and Jesus alone is the deliverance. But certainly be back here next week as we start to look at what life in the power of God's spirit is going to look like.